This is Popprint, an animal rescue community, episode 144. I'm Nancy Ree. And I'm Harold Ree. Today's guest is Renee Kaiser Riley with Summer May Photography. The next thing I heard was her mother screaming happily. And I looked over, and the young lady had tears rolling down her face and was trying to move her fingers herself. It was the first time in months that she had had any kind of reaction or showed that she was even still in there. We're super excited to have Renee Kaiser Riley on the show today. She is the photographer for Summer May Photography in Idaho, focused on the Idaho Humane Society, and Dog is my co-pilot, the organization headed by Dr. Peter Rourke that flies dogs from warm weather states to places such as Boise, Idaho. Renee also shares some very moving stories with her dog, Summer May, especially their many years together as a therapy dog team. If you'd like to learn more about Summer May Photography and see some wonderful photos, go to our show notes at thisispawprint.com slash 144. About three years ago, a friend of mine, June, she fosters dogs, and she said, will you take their photos? And when those became well-received, I did more and more photography of foster dogs. And then about a year ago, actually this month, I was asked to come out and do some photography for a lady who had interviewed the pilot for a rescue organization. I'd never heard of the organization, but I went out to the airport, and those pictures just, it waterfalled. It did. Since then, I have been out there for every delivery, uh, photographing those rescues, and they're being spread across the world. Tell folks uh, which airport uh, you're speaking of? That would be the... um, Jackson Jet Terminal at the Boise Airport, Boise, Idaho, and I've done several several trips out there. I, re- I don't think I've missed one since I started photographing for the rescue flight organization and the, our local sh- our local shelter, Idaho Humane Society. So Idaho Humane Society, and uh, which organizations usually fly in these deserving animals? The main one would be Dog is My Co-Pilot, Inc., and then I have also done a couple of photography sessions when wings of rescue have flown in. But 99% of my work is done for a dog as my co-pilot and, of course, always for Idaho Humane Society. On this show, we had Dr. Peter Rourke. What are your impressions of, of Dr. Rourke as, as you've gotten to know him over time? Dr. Rourke is an accomplished, intelligent, caring individual who has dedicated himself for the past five years to rescuing larger amounts of animals in one flight. A lot of organizations can fly a few animals. I believe he said that the first flight he ever did, he had five animals on board. And now he's had upwards of close to 200 animals on board. So, you know, more is better. The more we can pull out of a high-kill shelter that is called for help. As the saying says, every dog that you save, saves two. The one you, the one you rescued and the one that replaces it in the shelter. When the the uh, plane lands, that's when you get really busy. <laughs> and that's where it, it is. where it's a little bit of uh, chaos, maybe controlled chaos or not so controlled chaos. Uh, can you tell us how do you kind of deal with the unloading of all these animals and, and how do you actually squeeze in the time to take the photographs? In the beginning, nobody knew who I was. <laughs> so, but now... It's awesome because the people unloading the dogs from the planes will actually stop in front of me or, you know, so that I can get a picture where they'll say, come get, come look at this one. You've got to come get a picture of this one. So now they've adopted me in and I'm part of the group now. So, and everybody's very cooperative in making sure the animals get photographed. Once the dogs and cats land, a lot of folks Mm -hmm. volunteer, take these animals uh, out of the plane into some trucks and vans. Uh, what's been your experience as far as how long does it actually take for these uh, uh, animals to get adopted? Well, that's, that is probably something that's going to surprise a lot of people. Just to clarify, these are animals that were going to be euthanized if, we couldn't, if the organization could not have come and taken them out of the state that they were in or the shelter. And I know that here in Boise, the average adoption time is maybe a week. Amazing. It is amazing. So 
if I'm if, tearing up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, let's go with that. I mean, any kind of maybe any dogs or cats that really kind of stood out to you? I'm going to have to say that it was um, a recent delivery. It was completely out of ordinary in which Humane Society Idaho, oh, excuse me, Humane Society International was on the ground in Korea rescuing uh, dogs that were on a dog meat farm. They were being bred to be sold to a market and eaten. And they contacted Idaho Humane Society to see if they would receive the dogs, and they did. Dog is my co-pilot flew to California to pick those animals up, and they brought them here. As soon as I learned that this was happening, I was like, oh boy, I'd love to do that. And immediately I was contacted and said, will you please come be the photographer? And that was every one of those dogs. Well, you know, their faces are going to stick in my heart and my head for the rest of my life. There was a video I watched of the dogs and I was like, oh, thank God, they're coming here. They are not available to the public at this time, as far as I know. They needed some time for socialization skills and basic, you know, obedience training. And just for them to become accustomed to the fact that humans were going to be around them. Mm. Uh, Where they were at, they only saw a human when the person who was raising them, who did not live on the property, would come and feed them. So a pretty miserable existence, uh, ending with a death sentence in most cases. If this had not happened, uh, who knows what would have happened, right? Right. And I think it's fair to imagine the worst. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, just uh, a lot of of positive outcomes— regardless of where where these dogs and cats came from. When you uh, spread your photography around, as you said, through Facebook and and other means, uh, what's some of the responses that you've been getting? More than I could ever expect. Most recently, I think what really, really got to me was, dog is my co-pilot flew to San Antonio, and they've only done two, two rescues from there. The response from the foster family who had been pulled these dogs and said, we'll we'll foster them until we can find some place for them to go so that they're not euthanized. Their response to seeing their dog, you know, their dog that they fostered suddenly running in the grass here or coming off the plane here. I started getting so many contacts telling me that that just meant the world for them. I've had several that were telling me they were going to give up on fostering because it was too hard to not know what happened to the to the animal they fostered after it left. But that seeing those arrival photos encouraged them to continue being a foster family, knowing that they did the right thing. And they may miss the dog or you know, cat sometimes, gerbils, rabbits, you know. But seeing that they did the right thing and that the dog is going to be happy and is safe has just been life changers for them. Renee, that's incredible. How does that make you feel when you hear those comments? I feel like I found my calling. I really do. Um, you know, I've done a lot of things in my life, and this is where I need to stay, right with this. This isn't one of those things I was going to try out and see how well it went. I think I'll probably take my last breath pushing the button on my camera. <laughs> so. Good for you. Good for you. Well, it's so funny because... You know, ideally, you don't want to take a photo of a dog stuck behind a a crate door. But I'll tell you, even me personally, uh, my wife and I, we we have fostered, you know, one or two dogs or at least gotten to know some of the dogs before we load them onto a plane. And it is amazing how even just a day or two later, seeing one of your photos, it really does. It really does uh, make you feel great. Make you feel like a million bucks. Well, thank you. (laughs) should have brought tissues in here too besides a bottle of water <laughs> <laughs> probably about a month or so ago i started following them over to the shelter and getting the pictures of the dogs being released from the crates and stuff because i too was like okay i got a happy picture of a dog but there's bars in front of its face there's a crate door in front of it like what you said and i said i've got to do better and the first reaction to me doing what i called the out of the crate photos you know with them running in the grass and being on the trees, excuse me, you know, just with grins on their faces and then running around inside for the intake. The reactions to that, they surpassed what I thought people would would think about them. And I knew that never again could I could I miss that. 
You even got a chance to be Dr. Peter Rourke's co-pilot on one trip, which would ironically make you Dog is My Co-Pilot's co-pilot. I even got to re- read some of the gauges, you know? It's like, what does that one say? And I'm like, at this point, I was like, let's see, I'm 54. Am I too old to go get my pilot's license and do this myself? Ooh, <laughs> you know? the spark has been kindled. I like this. Once we got in the air, we got past the, the takeoff, you know, where it's a little little rocky in that plane. Uh, the animals quiet down. And they just go to sleep. You don't hear from them again until you start to land. So it was awesome. It's cramped. You're strapped in. But, you know, I had charming company over there piloting the plane. And at one point, we even put one of the cell phones up and started watching the Cubs game. So... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Dr. Rourke is a huge Cubs fan, and now that they've actually won a World Series, he's probably irrepressible at this point. So, Yeah, a little bit, I think. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I've had the opportunity to talk to him a lot and and spend time around him, and yeah, he is a Cubs fan, and I think that uh, he was a little intrigued when he found out that my, I am related to one of the biggest names in the Cubs history, so. (laughs) Oh, who's that? I had an automatic. Don Zimmer. Oh, of he course. He played for a lot of different teams. Yeah. He played for a lot of different teams, and then he coached, and then he managed, and Cubs yep. was one of the... Cubs and the, and the, Yan- and the really Yankees, big. and the Yankees at one point. Thank you. And the Dodgers, and the Padres, and the, and I grew up with my grandmother listening to baseball games on the radio because she was following Don Zimmer because he was her cousin. Ooh. So he was my third cousin. I never got to meet him, but you know, I'm one of those people going, oh yeah, yeah. You know, I'm kind of distantly related to baseball royalty. Could you maybe tell us, obviously your name is uh, Renee Kaiser Riley, yet the photography uh, operation that, that, that you, that you started is Summer May. Uh, tell us a little bit about how the name Summer May Photography came about. In March of 2001, I was adopted. My family was adopted by a yellow lab trapped in a Basset Helm body, and her name was Summer May. Uh, she and I went on to become registered therapy dog teams. Uh, we traveled the state. I became keynote speaker at seminars and training classes about the benefits of having a pet therapy program. I lost her last year in February, and somebody asked me, do you have an album of your pictures? And I said, well, no. So I decided to start a Facebook page of my photography and it just seemed it just seemed natural to name it after her because because of her I got out of my rut that I had in my life and I went out and we conquered the world together so I figured if I was gonna take on photography, she deserved the honor of being of it being named after her. What made Summer May special to you? Besides being an, a fantastic, intelligent, loving, funny dog. Um, she was my heart and soul dog. It's like she read my mind. She knew what I wanted to do. She knew how I felt. But I think the thousands of amazing experiences we shared together doing pet therapy, it just tightened the bond even more. And she seemed to be aware that something that had just happened was amazing. And it was because of her, without going into HIPAA details, one of the most positive, uplifting things that ever happened with us was a young lady who had received a traumatic brain injury, had been non-responsive to anything for months, just kind of sat there, didn't track light, didn't react to sound or pain or anything. And I was asked if I would bring in a therapy dog and see if she responds to that because she loved animals. The day that I was headed to school over there, my grandfather died. And he happened to be in the same facility that she was in. And I thought, I'm nothing I can do about Grandpa. Right now they're doing all the running around and all over the place. And I will join up with them once they've settled down at my grandparents' house. And I went to see her with another lady with a dog. I talked to her. I, uh, her arms had um, tightened up. We had to gently stretch out her arm. Got Summer up next to her on a chair, and I explained to her that there was a dog. And I guided her hand over to Summer May and started stroking Summer May with her hand. 
And the next thing I heard was her mother screaming happily. And I looked over and the young lady had tears rolling down her face and was trying to move her fingers herself. It was the first time in months that she had had any kind of reaction or showed that she was even still in there. Wow. I've got goosebumps every time I talk about it. <laughs> that, li- that young lady, from what I've been told, her mom kept in touch with me for a long time. Um, she's not going to walk again, but she does talk, and she's aware, and she's living her life again. Mm. A modified version, but she's living life again. So. What do you think it is about an animal or an animal's uh, presence or touch even that is he- more healing, let's say, than medicine or what a human can do? There have been numerous, um, huge, huge studies done about this. And all of them have shown that petting an animal releases different chemicals in your body. It's a bunch of technical terms as far as the names and stuff that there are. It releases endorphins. It releases oxytocin, which I'm not going to tell you what that is. You'll have to look it up so that you can giggle in private. The release of those chemicals into a body stimulate brain activity. And it has been shown to release, to reduce blood pressure and heart rate. Um, individuals with dementia, Alzheimer's, they tend to have a condition called sundowner syndrome where later in the evening for some reason they become more agitated and more confused studies were done that showed that by bringing in a dog for an hour once a week the effect physically on the chemistry of their body and their brains improved and it lasted for one or two weeks without another introduction of an animal for them to pet so physically, it is healing internally. How long were you and Summer May a therapy team? And how do you actually get started as a therapy team? Uh, we were a team for six years. We were registered through an organization <clears throat> that at the time was called Therapy Dogs Incorporated. They've now changed their name, name to Alliance of Therapy Dogs. Um, I very quickly went from being just a handler, which is the person with a dog doing visiting to becoming a tester observer for that organization. Tester observers are the ones that initially meet you. They do some you know, temperament testing on your dog. How does it relate? How does it listen to you? How does it react to somebody in a wheelchair or somebody running past or being around other dogs, all that? And then they're taken into medical facilities and the public, and we do observations on them. Personally, Summer and I were involved in, at least partially or fully involved, in the testing observing process of over 600 teams. And a team is one handler with one dog. If you don't know anybody involved in it, you can contact. In this area, I'm going to say 99% of the dogs are registered through ATD. Alliance of Therapy Dogs, and you just can go to their website and tell them I would like to apply, and they will find a tester observer in your area and help you start the process. How do folks find you, whether it's uh, on the web, social media? Yeah, word of mouth, really. I'm only on Facebook, and uh, that's why you see me say, share this album, share this album, share this album. I don't have a website. As of yet, I have never sold a photograph. I mean, I've made no money from this. Uh, every now and then, somebody looks at the Summer May Facebook page and realizes that there's other albums, too, like landscapes and weather and flowers. And you know, so They're like, oh, you don't just do rescue dogs. But you asked me earlier about a moment you know, that stands out, and I think that has to be a couple weeks ago, when a friend of mine called me up and she was very excited. She goes, oh, our friends just adopted a dog. And I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. She goes, from the Humane Society. And I'm like, oh, that's wonderful. And she goes, and they they brought it over here for us to meet the dog and the dog is awesome. And I said, well, great. And she goes, you want to know how they learned about the dog? They held up their cell phone and said, we saw this picture and we needed to go meet this dog. It was a photograph I had taken and put in and was in one of my albums. And I found out that that's been the case You know, the photos are helping get the faces out there and people are showing up to the shelter going, 
we saw this dog, you know, so I don't know how many times, but even once is a huge success. If you had a magic wand and could do Mm. something to change the state of animal rescue, what do you think you'd do? Biggest thing right now is more education about staying and neutering. And I'm probably going to upset some people right here, but I really need, I really believe that there need to be laws that you must stay and neuter your pets unless you are a certified breeder, which don't get me started on that one. But, um, yeah, I think there should be heavy fines. And if we can get the animals spayed and neutered, guess what? We don't have so many extra animals running around that we can't put into homes because there's more animals in homes. We want to say thank you to Renee Kaiser Riley for sharing her story. If you want to learn more about summer mate photography in Idaho and see some inspiring photos, go to our show notes at thisispawprint.com slash 144. All the music you hear on Pawprint is composed, performed, and produced by the amazing Luke Gartner Brereton, the most talented man in all of Brisbane. You can find him at info dot vanillagroovemedia.com If you'd like to listen to more episodes of Paw Print, you can find us on your favorite podcast app, such as Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, or Podcast Addict. Make sure to search for Paw Print Animal Rescue and hit the subscribe button to get the latest episodes immediately. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Search for This Is Paw Print, all one word. Thank you to all of you for sharing paw print with your friends and family. We've now been listened to in over 130 countries and territories, and we couldn't have done it without your support. So thanks. And remember, you spread a positive message of love and peace by saving an animal. Have a great day, everyone. And see you next time on Paw Print. Paw Print is a production of EVER Education. You can't handle the truth.